Good evening, everyone. My name is Pauline McIntosh, and I would like to welcome you this evening to the third in a series of webinars that we've been hosting on affordable housing in Nova Scotia and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. To begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered here this evening in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered um, by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship, which Mi'kmaq and Maliseet peoples first signed with the British Crown in 1725. We are grateful to be treaty people, and knowing there are people with us this evening from outside Nova Scotia, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional and unceded territories in which they are located. At this time, I am really pleased to welcome our speakers, Jen Arnfield, Chad Maida, and Connie Clement. Thanks to each of you for agreeing to be with us this evening. Your time, your knowledge, and your participation are greatly appreciated. So without further ado, I will first welcome uh, Jen Arnfield and Chad Maida from the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. Jen is the lead of sustainable affordable housing at the Green Municipal Fund. She led the design of the program offering and is now focused on the successful delivery and continuous improvement of this program. She previously led affordable housing strategy, policy and research for a municipal government. And Chad is the outreach advisor for uh, the Green Municipal Fund's Sustainable Affordable Housing Initiative. He has over 10 years experience in the affordable housing sector. And as an outreach advisor, Chad attracts and retains high impact capital project opportunities from across the country to help strengthen the affordable housing sector. He is a member of CMHC's expert community on housing, College of Reviewers, and I would certainly like to welcome Jen and Chad at this time. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just start by uh, thanking Pauline so much for hosting us today and, uh, and also just acknowledging that we're joining from Ottawa, which is uh, on the unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start us off today. And I just wanted to start by kind of setting the scene in terms of why we're talking about energy efficiency in affordable housing, um, knowing that the affordable housing sector is one with many competing priorities. So why can we are on energy um, to the sector? And as a starting point, um, just to acknowledge that a significant percentage of Canada's carbon emissions come from buildings. So that would, uh, that would include residential buildings and affordable housing buildings. So to meet Canada's climate goals, um, the existing stock of buildings across the country needs to be addressed. And something unique to the affordable housing sector in particular is that about three quarters of the stock was built uh, at least over 30 years ago, if not much more, um, which reflects kind of the periods of, of federal investment in housing in the country. And so many of these older buildings were built with single pane windows, perhaps inefficient boilers, leaking envelopes. And so they cost quite a bit in energy to maintain. Um, there's also a number of buildings in the sector currently with other maintenance and repair needs that require addressing, meaning there's a lot of opportunity for retrofits, which could include energy improvements as well. So next slide, please. And one um, kind of additional and important consideration in the context of inefficient older housing is that of energy poverty. And that's kind of qualitatively described as the experience of households that struggle in meeting their home energy needs, which would typically include electricity and home heating. So currently there's no kind of formal or official definition for energy poverty in Canada, um, but the Canadian Urban Sustainability Practitioners Network, um, whose research we used here in this presentation, they measure energy poverty as a household paying 6% or more of their after-tax income on energy. And so for reference, most households in Canada pay 3%, that's the average um, of their after-tax income on energy. And so this measure reflects at least twice that national average. 
And I think it's particularly interesting to think about this definition in comparison to core housing need, which is possibly uh, something that many on this, this call may be familiar with. That considers housing unaffordable when the shelter costs are more than 30% of the total before tax household income. But this affordability criteria notably does not consider housing costs outside of rent or mortgage payments. So it doesn't account for uh, utilities or other costs such as transportation. And as you can imagine, many of the impacts of core housing need and energy poverty are the same in terms of the need to choose between paying for shelter or energy and other essentials like groceries or medication and the mental health impacts associated with making those kinds of decisions. Energy poverty and core housing need also both disproportionately impact marginalized populations like lone parent households, particularly those led by women, as well as indigenous and recent immigrant households. So next slide, please. So I just wanted to contextualize this a little bit. Um, across Canada, about 20% of households are in energy poverty. So paying that, that 6% um, and about 13% are in core housing need, just to kind of put those two against each other. And while we know the affordable housing sector is a key solution in addressing core housing need in Canada, and I know is always interested in ensuring affordability, there does remain actually some opportunity to address energy poverty within the sector. As of 2016, uh, about 45% of households that, are, that were living in non-market housing were paying for their utilities. And about 17% of households that were living in non-market housing we're in energy poverty, again, paying more than 6% of their after-tax income on utilities. In fact, 5% of households living in non-market housing were paying more than 15% of their after-tax income on energy and heating. So if you look at the last chart on this slide, that considers these two factors together. So those that were living in non-market housing and paying for the, their utilities and in energy poverty. And when you look at that kind of segregation of the, the numbers, that's 37% of households, which is quite significant. And energy retrofits present a great opportunity to make a considerable impact in the affordability of this housing overall. Next slide, please. So there's a number of great reasons to undertake energy efficiency projects in affordable housing, some of which I've kind of talked, <laughs> talked about already. Um, there's Significant opportunities to reduce operating and maintenance costs through deep retrofits or keep operating costs low with efficient new builds. Um, typically, the cost savings can be between 40 and 60%. Energy retrofits can be planned and combined with other required maintenance to create efficiencies in funding applications and in project management. And building efficient, sustainable buildings also provides an opportunity to address the challenges of a changing climate, including through increasing building resilience. And we were actually just, just talking before we kind of went live about the, the hurricane that's coming, so significantly important. And I, I do wish the best for everyone joining us from Nova Scotia when that hurricane hits. Um, it also provides an opportunity for more affordable cooling options for health and well being of residents. And in a warming climate, that's becoming more and more important as well. So we do know, though, that the choice to take on these projects often will come down to the capital costs. And that's where our program uh, can come in to help. So I'm going to pass it over to Chad to speak to, to our program now. Yeah, thanks, Jen. Um, so for those that may not know FCM, uh, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities has been the national voice of municipal government since 1901. Uh, we have nearly 2,000 members across the country representing more than 90% of Canada's population. FCM advocates to the federal government on behalf of municipalities and also delivers programming to help municipalities tackle local challenges. Uh, our largest program is the Green Municipal Fund, or GMF. Uh, it's a leading program in driving local green innovation across the country with two missions, one of which to support municipal initiatives in sustainable development through funding. And the second is to share knowledge and lessons learned through online resources and tools, training, and peer learning activities and networking opportunities. And uh, Jen will talk a bit more about that later on. 
The fund is open to municipalities large and small uh, in every province and territory. Uh, GMF is a $1.6 billion program funded by the government of Canada to support municipal efforts in improving air, water, soil quality, and more. And we'll talk a bit about that now. So GMF was established in the year 2000 through an endowment from the federal government um, and is managed by FCM, FCM with oversight from Infrastructure Canada, Environment and Climate Change Canada, and Natural Resources Canada. We offer funding in five key sectors, uh, which is transportation, waste, water, land use, and energy. And in 2019, the federal budget significantly expanded our work uh, of GMF through a $950 million investment in three new streams, uh, one of which is the Sustainable Affordable Housing Initiative. So $300 million was allocated uh, for affordable housing uh, and in its 20 years, GMF has funded some local affordable housing projects. Uh, however, this investment significantly expands our capacity um, to, to focus and design um, projects that meet the needs of today's conditions. Um, the program launched in May 2020 and was designed with the guidance of an advisory group uh, made up of experts currently working in the sector. So this is an overview of the funding that we offer. And uh, I'll start with our planning grant, which is simple, uh, quick way for applicants to access um, some funding to initiate that energy concept um, and develop the design of what needs to be in place uh, for the project to meet our criteria. We can fund up to $25,000 and up to 80% of project costs. Uh, our study grant is intended to provide uh, funding for more detailed pre-construction planning of a project. Typically we see feasibility, options analysis, and energy modeling work really well for this grant and it's definitely helped set projects up for our capital financing. Here we can fund up to $125,000 for up to 50% of project costs. Our pilot grant is intended to enable a small scale uh, or a small test of a particularly innovative concept. Uh, the pilot funding will allow providers to confirm an approach and will hopefully lead to scaling up into a larger capital project. As we head into the fall, we're looking to exceed our expectations in delivering best in class scalable projects to Canadian cities and communities across the country. We can fund up to $500,000 that can cover 80% of eligible project costs for new builds and retrofits. For retro, retrofits, our funding is intended to support providers in striving for deeper energy savings. Our capital financing offers a combination of grants and loans. The grant portion is tied to the anticipated energy savings of a project, starting at 25% energy reduction and up to 50% energy, energy reduction. So basically, if a project anticipates about 25% reduction in energy, it will receive a 25% grant. A 50% energy reduction will equate to a 50% grant. And we can finance up to $10 million for up to 80% of project eligible project costs. For new builds, our funding covers the incremental costs associated with a very ambitious net zero energy ready project. Our capital financing will cover up to 20% of project costs uh, for up to $10 million, which is 50% uh, grant and 50% loan. Our research shows that it typically costs approximately 10% more to build to this higher standard. So effectively, we are providing a grant to do so. The stackability of our funding is particularly important for new builds where we're funding a small portion of a project cost to support better outcomes. So for an organization to be eligible for our funding, the lead applicant must either be a municipality, a municipal owned, municipally owned corporation or a nonprofit housing provider uh, or a housing cooperative. Uh, for a project to be eligible for funding, it must achieve uh, energy efficiency and affordability requirements. From an affordability perspective, rents for at least 30% of the units must be less than 80% of the local median market rent. 
Retrofit projects must aim to achieve at least 25% reduction in energy redu consumption, um, which is the starting scale, uh, starting point for a sliding scale grant. New build projects must aim to achieve net zero energy ready. Uh, so with some additional guidance, um, we're looking for very energy efficient building that has a total energy use intensity of 80 kilowatt hours per meter square or 120 kilowatt hours per meter square for projects in the north. Realizing that this is Nova Scotia, um, we want, I want to just mention that because we do recognize the additional challenges uh, projects face across the country. The TUI shows that the total energy consumed in a building, including natural gas and electricity in a year based on the building square footage. So for reference, a typical building built to today's standards would have a TUI of around 200 kilowatt hours per meter squared. And I'll just uh, send it back to Jen to just chat about a couple projects that we funded, which is really exciting because these are the projects that uh, we can share and use as examples to help motivate folks to get these projects started. Yeah, thanks, Chad. And so we wanted to use a couple of examples for inspiration from elsewhere in Canada, recognizing that we are lucky enough to have uh, Connie with us to talk about the um, her excellent pilot project that was funded by SAW as well. So more to come in terms of examples and probably in much more detail than we're gonna get here, but quickly a few kind of for inspiration. So um, this is a capital project, it's an Edmonton um, co-op that was built in 1978 and it has 59 wood frame town townhouses um, all with rents that are less than 80 percent of the median market rate so their project is a deep energy retrofit that was supported by saw and it's going to be one of canada's first scale-ups of the energy sprung concept so that's a, a concept that uses prefabricated panels for like min minimal disruption in a retrofit so in this project they're adding panels insulation and a new roof with barrier wrapped ceilings to their existing structure the retrofit is also going to transition the units to full electricity by adding air source heat pumps, heat recovery ventilators, and converting water heating from gas to electric. Um, so this is in Alberta, similar to Nova Scotia, um, the grid is high carbon. So for this type of electrification project, it can actually end up having a net increase in GHG emissions. So to offset that, um, from a climate perspective, it was really important to also add on-site electricity generation through renewable, um, renewable sources. So in this case, they've added solar. And with the addition of solar, the co-op is actually getting quite close to net zero. So when the project is finished, the solar will produce 78% of the post retrofit electrical needs for the project. This retrofit also um, will increase services for residents like central air and cooling, which was not part of this project before the retrofit. Uh, additionally, members currently pay for their own gas and power, which is going to move to be centralized and paid through the cooperative afterwards. A key to success in this project was bringing co-op members along in the journey. So they had at least 15 membership workshops. And they created a newsletter as well to provide continuous updates to residents throughout the project. Um, very important as residents were remaining in-house for the duration of the renovation. So clearly communication is, is critically uh, essential to the project. So this approach was interesting. The organization actually piloted um, the, um, the structural pieces on two units, um, previously not funded by SAW, but funded by Natural Resources Canada. And then they applied those learnings from the two units to the remaining 57, which is this now significant capital project. Next slide, please. Okay, and so 
Now, this is, uh, on the other hand, a new build project supported by SAW. And I really love this example because of the innovation in terms of a municipal and nonprofit partnership. Um, Rossland is a small community of just over 4,000 people in the Kootenays Rocky region of central British Columbia. It's just a few kilometers north of the US border. Uh, the city of Rossland and the Lower Columbia Affordable Housing Society partnered to construct a 37 unit building to address a lack of workforce housing for moderate income working individuals and families. So the project is going to house Rossland's new city hall on the first floor with affordable housing above it for three stories. The building is targeting net zero energy ready with an aim to support the city's net zero by 2050 ambitions. To achieve this environmental standard, the building's going to use efficient mechanical and electrical systems, a highly insulated building envelope, high efficiency windows and LED lighting. And with support from SAW funding, the project was able to improve its environmental outcomes and increase the affordability of its units. Okay, next slide, please. So in addition, and uh, Chai kind of alluded to this already, so in addition to uh, the funding of projects, another part of our sustainable affordable housing mandate is to build the sector's capacity in energy efficient projects. Uh, we do this in a, in a number of ways. Um, we have a number of resources online on our website and that um, is linked at the end of this presentation. Online, you'll find some case studies for inspiration, some fact sheets to provide guidance um, on kind of getting started in particular um, in different pieces of your project. Um, we also have a resource library for other external resources linked that will be helpful for you. Um, we do a number of these types of webinars and um, we're, we're gonna be attending a number of conferences and doing presentations as well um, that are more kind of capacity development focused. We also have a peer learning community of practice and that's for all of uh, the recipients of our planning and study grants that are working on retrofits. And it's a way to connect with peers uh, and learn from each other as you're moving your project through to hopefully getting to the capital project stage. Um, and we provide specific training um, opportunities as well through that community of practice that's very much guided by the participants. And it's not on this slide, but I did also want to kind of give a, a little preview that we have a new energy guide for affordable housing providers that's coming soon. Um, watch our channels because it's, it's going to be released, I believe, on October 4th, and it's going to be a new super helpful resource as well. So we'll be um, definitely promoting that. So more to come there as a new tool as well. Next slide, please. And then finally, um, this particular capacity development initiative I, needs its own slide. <laughs> it's it's quite, quite exciting and a, a big piece of work for us. It's our Regional Energy Coach Pilot. We partnered with the BC Nonprofit Housing Association, the Cooperative Housing Federation of Canada, and the Community Housing Transformation Center to deliver free coaching services particularly focused on supporting affordable housing providers to identify opportunities to incorporate energy efficiency and environmental measures into their retrofit projects and to plan these projects and access funding for their initiatives. Um, so it, you know, if this type of support would be helpful to you, reach out to us or to our partner organizations. Um, again, it's all kind of free support available. So next slide, please. And then to close, I, uh, I did want to also make the tie back to the SDGs because I know that's the theme of this series and I wanna thank Pauline for providing some, some thoughts on this that informed this slide. Um, I'll acknowledge that our program wasn't directly designed around the SDGs, but I'm sure, you know, as you've been listening, you've probably been able to make some connections. It is certainly addressing many of the goals. We, I've, I've put a number of them on the slides. You could probably make an argument that there's others that uh, it contributes to as well. I think our program is quite unique um, in where it sits, kind of at the intersection of these two crises um, in climate change and housing affordability. Um, obviously, the problem is far greater than what our $300 million can do 
But between our capacity building efforts and our early stage funding, the plans and grants for seeding and planning projects, I do think we're punching quite above our weight in like through our multi-solving program that hits so many of, of the SDGs. So I just wanted to at least draw a little bit of a tie there for you to, to close out our presentation. So the last slide is just how to contact us here, um, but we can, we can put this information in the chat as well. So you have it, uh, have it available. Thank you so much. Uh, Jen and Chad, thank you. Oh my goodness, you've provided us with a tremendous amount of information and also context for the programs that you offer through FCM. And I was really, really delighted to see your last slide, uh, Jen, that, that pointed out some of the sustainable development goals that your programming addresses. And um, I, I think it was just so evident throughout your presentation. When we think about the very first of the sustainable development goals, no poverty, you know, we know that creating quality homes that reduce energy costs for tenants lessens the demand on other, other household cash flow and allows more, more dollars for food and other essential items. Uh, we know that supporting things like community gardens and other programs also contributes to this overall goal. When we think about affordable and clean energy, your program directly supports this goal in terms of raising the bar to try to achieve net zero energy use for affordable housing developments, as was exemplified in the, in the two examples that you shared. Uh, just a whole host of ways that the program contributes to the creation of sustainable cities and communities. And uh, so I thank you so much for bringing, bringing to light how, how your program can actually help um, communities uh, work toward and, and hopefully achieve affordable housing that's in, in better alignment with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And I'm really thrilled to, to introduce our next presenter, who is Connie Clement. Uh, Connie is a volunteer director of the Antigonish Affordable Housing Society. And uh, Antigonish Affordable Housing is a recipient of the FCM funding program and is benefiting greatly from that support. And Connie, uh, in addition to her volunteer work, she has been the director of the National Collaborating Center for the Determinants of Health here at St. Francis Xavier University. And that's a national public health knowledge center from 2011 until she retired in 2019. And prior to that, Connie worked for Toronto Public Health, Health Nexus, Social Venture Partners Toronto, and Women Health Sharing, and has participated in a range of boards and coalitions. So I'm really pleased to welcome Connie to the program this evening. And Connie is going to share with us some of the experience of the Antigonish Affordable Housing Society and to talk about how it has benefited from the program and how it has enabled us to work in closer alignment with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Welcome, Connie. Thanks, Pauline. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, and I think I just want to start by saying um, in my adult life, I have always worked in improving health because health touches everyone and everyone's everyone. And if you can shift health, you're shifting whole populations, whole communities, whole societies, and housing is certainly a key part of that. And I joined the Antigonish Affordable Housing Society as a board member about a year and a half ago because when I looked around Antigonish, it was certainly one of the high achieving, very successful, um, significant impact um, charities that I could link with. So if I just um, start with um, a affordable housing society itself, um, there, you can see a huge alignment with the both the SDG and with the FCM program. Um, the F SDG 11.1, .1, which is the affordable housing, is that by 2030, um, the world will have adequate, safe, and affordable housing along with basic services. And so that is very much part of what we're doing. And we have added to expanded safe into um, socially sustainable community building um, and um, brought in that huge piece of environment, which Jen and Chad have already linked to both social benefits and um, 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 affordability benefits. 
Um, and what I'm going to do is mostly just show you um, images as I talk. Um, but um, I want to stress that we have our space in the housing continuum is we're doing affordable housing, which means we're not at the, we're non-market, we're not at the high end or the market end, but we're also not at the homeless shelter, um, highest supportive housing for people with disabilities and illness. Um, as I describe, you will um, hear the way in which we um, do support our tenants, but um, we're in that middle space. Um, so at the moment, we have 26 occupied units in two developments, um, and um, all of our units are below market rent. Last year, um, some data showed us that they were 60 to 75 percent below rent market, depending on the size of the unit. Um, we have 30 percent of our tenants receive government subsidies at the moment. We have one to three bedroom units. Um, we have families and singles. We have all ages among our tenants are immigrants, indigenous, African Nova Scotian. Um, and um, many people born locally you do have to be a resident for three years. Um, um, so you have to be grounded in Anaganesha County, um, but many are uh, people who have moved here um, as they uh, moved ahead in life. Um, we are a volunteer organization. Um, and I'll go back to that a bit later. But um, so um, we have a um, um, our pilot grant, as Jen mentioned, um, really matches all three aspects of the um, FCM program, um, reducing energy usage, increasing housing affordability, and improving building quality. Um, included within that is comfort and quality of the life for tenants. And those are very essential for us. Um, and then, um, so I'm really gonna focus on that project um, and I could offer more history or detail later or in a different uh, setting, but not so much tonight. Um, and then um, if I start with the environmental pieces, because we have a three-prong mission. We have a mission, as you saw at the beginning, about environmental sustainability, also social community building, sustainability, and affordability. So I'm going to start with environment. Um, and, um, and I think um, um, Jen did a really nice uh, examples from the other projects that match a lot of our stuff. So we think maybe um, we're going to be the first affordable housing um, in Nova Scotia to be net zero um, because of our FCM um, funding. And that's a very exciting thing. Um, and um, power, as Jen mentioned, uh, power bills were a real barrier in our first housing um, for tenants. We had a tenant with as much as $2,000 in arrear and others with significant arrears. Um, and so we moved fairly quickly to absorb that inside the rents. And, um, and we've gone forward that way. And as we started to do that, we said, well, then we have to be producing our own electricity to make that affordable. And so that's when we reached out to FCM. And I was just joining the board, but we had already been in discussion with FCM um, before uh, this, the Green Fund, um, kind of came into full fruition and we were able to step in quickly. Um, so at our first housing development, I am going to use two terms. Riverside was our first, Appleseed's our second. You don't need to know which is which, but I will probably use those terms. Um, so um, we have solar on the roof at Riverside. We'd like to do some more. Um, we have at uh, the rooftop solar at Appleseed covers a third of our needs right now. We had intended to do on ground um, and, um, and bumped into an issue where um, the sewers uh, ran right where we wanted to put those in ground. And with the kind of strong partnerships that we have with both um, of our two municipalities, county and town, and each of our town and county have donated land for each of the bills, as well as giving us grants. We were able to go to the town because wonderfully we live in a town that's aiming to also be um, one of the greenest, most energy neutral towns in Canada, and they're developing a solar park. And so we went back to FCM and we worked with the town. And as that solar park comes fully up to speed, we will have solar um, panels within that park that, will, that are ours, and it will bring us to net zero. 
Um, and that's really exciting. Um, we still have an aspiration to, you know, if we can do more at Apple Seed, that would be wonderful. And we'll just see how we keep building that. Um, I think the other parts of the environment beyond solar, um, just like Jen talked about in um, the one of the Western projects, uh, we piloted building first, we built four units, figured out a whole lot of learning, improved, went from there. And, um, but every aspect of our construction um, is environmentally sound uh, using environmentally uh, modern engineering and quality materials. Um, and the building exceeds the National Energy Code of buildings in every way, uh, foundations, walls, enclosures, windows, um, all of that. We used a fair bit of prefab um, in the first build in particular. Um, and I just recently learned that um, when we finished that first big build, not the pilot, but the big build, we had only three wheelbarrows of on-site waste. Um, at the end of that project. That was pretty amazing that the builders really joined us in that effort. Um, all the units are heated with um, heat pumps. We have high ventilation, um, energy efficient lights, all of those type of things. Um, and um, so by absorbing that, those heating costs, we stabilize and predict um, costs for tenants, which has made a huge difference for their ability to plan other activities, both and because the rent is low. Um, but it also means that as communities, um, our two developments are using significantly less energy. Um, as I've said, we have that whole um, combined piece of social affordability and environment. So often those factors overlap and walkability would be one. We have not, we have purposely placed our housing projects where people can walk. Uh, the newest project is right across the street from um, two of the schools, um, accessible to town. We have a community transit program in Antigonish. And so our two units are stops on that community transit. Um, and um, part of our FCM commitment is that we'll be measuring our achievements of outcomes and whether we've met targets and how well have we done. Um, and then if I take us over to social and community building, there's three key aspects that would play into that across the board at each development. We have a community navigator, um, one staff who splits her role between project management and community navigation. Um, she is not the social worker, but she finds the social worker. We have community rooms that are used for tenants personal work as well as others, but also for group community kitchens, etc. As you can imagine, the pandemic put a real wrench into that and we're just being excited about taking that further forward. We have community gardens at each of the sites and it's been really wonderful to watch tenants learn about community gardening, um, learn about gardening um, and help each other. And so it builds community as well as contributing to environmental impact and um, a number of, particularly at the newer unit, very few tenants have uh, cars. Tenants are um, directly involved. We have tenant advisory group at each uh, development that meets regularly and we have a tenant rep on the board. It's very important that um, First Voice have a space. We've been reshifting some of that and trying to make it work better, but that's a core piece for us. I'm gonna loop right back to affordable as I close down, but um, that um, I've touched on all of that, but that's the affordability, the gardens, the rent, the uh, hydro, all of that. Um, the federal minister recently joined us and to announce the FCM funding and, um, or the an investment federally. Um, and the tenant who spoke at that event um, talk specifically about the fact that she had had 15 prior efforts at housing. She's a quite young woman and she had been evicted. She had been unable to meet rent, et cetera. And living in our housing has brought her a community. It's brought her stability. It's brought her security. And it's brought her hope that she didn't have before. Um, it's not without challenges as a small organization that's a volunteer run, it's huge. Um, um, but that's for another day too. And just as I close, I wanna talk about the final, about a quarter of the funding from FCM is um, an impact evaluation and learning piece. Um, we're trying to determine 
uh, the benefits and strengths of our three-part model so that we can share that with others. And we're uh, looking at what policy structures, procedures, partnerships, et cetera, are working well and what could be strengthened. And our intention is to help our board improve, but also to share that information with the whole sector. Um, and we're very excited about that work going forward. And I just wanna close by saying that FCM has been a wonderful partner all the way along. Um, I had the pleasure of working with FCM when I used to work for City of Toronto in public health. So this was a coming around again to connect with FCM this time. Um, the project staff worked with us as we developed the proposal. And as it took a long time, to get to approval, but they were with us at every step. Um, and particularly when we hit that kind of hurdle that we didn't expect of not being able to do the on ground, um, FCM was with us as we sorted uh, alternate solutions. And um, so I just wanna say that it's been a marvelous relationship and that I would encourage you to look for that kind of funding. I think that's it. Connie, thank you so much. My goodness, you've shared a lot of information and you've really brought to life for us um, what, what the FCM program has offered Antigonish Affordable Housing and how it connects with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. I mean, it's so clear from what you talked about that uh, if, we, if we think about uh, SDG number three, for example, good health and well-being, that creating quality homes improves the, the physiological health of the people who live there, but also the value of housing security on overall health and well-being. Uh, you know, you talked about the sense of community, the sense of belonging, um, the social connection that's been provided for some of the folks living uh, within the developments. It's absolutely incredible. Uh, another thing that I really like to think about is the value of creating good quality homes for people who live on low income and how that in and of itself begins to reduce inequalities. <coughs> Excuse me. I think uh, Pauline, you would know, Pauline is also linked with Antigonish Affordable Housing and would have been involved earlier than me. But I think one of the things that's interesting that I've learned is how much uh, both people at different levels of government and potential partners push back. Um, people don't need living rooms that big you don't need a community room. Why should we fund the community room? Um, um, you know, um, and I'm so proud of the housing because the newest housing is right next to some other new housing on both sides. And you would never know that one set is targeted affordably and the other set is full market. They look like their sister developments. That's so true, Connie. Thank you. Yes, and full disclosure, I too am on the board of Antigonish Affordable Housing Society, and I'm really, really proud of the work that we've been able to do and excited about our ongoing and ever-present need to learn. It's a constant um, state of, of evolution and growth and uh, figuring out the best path forward. And like, like uh, Connie said, um, partnering with FCM has certainly been a very positive experience uh, for us, and we're we're grateful to have the opportunity to work together and to share our experience with other organizations. And having said that, we have got about 10 minutes where we can certainly begin to address um, any questions that might, uh, might be placed in chat. And thanks to our colleague, Nancy, who is, who's in the, in the space this evening, and she's encouraged people uh, to offer any comments or questions in chat. So I'm just gonna take a look here and see if I can if I can uh, pick, on, pick up one here to present to our speakers. Um, so Lori has commented, thank you for sharing your success story. Very impressive. We are a small volunteer led organization and we are in the early stages of trying to create affordable housing in our village. Can you tell me what was the main source of funding for the construction at Riverside? And did you have any corporate support? Was it mostly grants? So Connie, I'll turn that over to you first. And, and if there's anything I can add, I'll do some a little bit later. Yeah. Um, and I think what's, um, so I wanna also capture your very small volunteer led organization. Um, human resources continues to be a crisis for us at every step. Um, it is not tenable um, that the nonprofit sector is doing this kind of work with no support for staffing and core functions from um, 
uh, government and key funders, right? We can get project money, we can't get operational core money. So I just want to name that because um, you're gonna, it's going to be a challenge and uh, you have to find people with sustained passion and it's going to be there. But so the first set of housing, we did do a donor campaign. Um, we are very lucky to have the Sisters of St. Martha in town. They are a service order. Um, and um, so they really gave the very first piece of money and they gave time and they gave expertise early on. The town and the county have both given grants to each development and the town gave the first land and the county gave the second land. So we haven't had to buy land. That is a huge factor if you have to buy land. Um, and then um, we, we took out a mortgage. Um, and as you all probably know, um, you know, we are facing a mortgage interest rate that will uh, potentially double. It will at least be one and a half times as big when it comes to maturity next year. Um, this is a huge issue for us. Um, and then the other thing that I would say we didn't find, in, and we had government grants, um, Housing Nova Scotia and I don't think we have federal money for the first one. Second one, we had uh, federal and provincial money, um, a significant portion of it loan, mortgage. Um, the other thing that's useful to know, there was a competition from the insurance company Aviva, um, which our little tiny organization won a national competition. We got $100,000 that built the community room at Riverside. I have no, I remember when I first heard that affordable housing was going to do this. I thought they don't have a hope in hell. And, um, and we got it. And I wasn't there yet. So I can't say we, but uh, it's amazing. Um, I think what's also very important, although we were able to take more advantage of um, the Canada mortgage and housing money for the second build, costs have gone up. Second build is similar size. It costs a million dollars more than the first build. We're estimating that the next build will cost more. We are carrying the percentage of debt for our second build was bigger than our first build. That's not sustainable. So we're just looking at how do we approach a donor campaign differently and bring in more corporate money because we didn't do a lot. We brought in some corporate leaders individually as donors, but not corporate donations significantly. And so how can we get more of that and how do we build into our concept of a capital campaign your core money more than bricks and mortar. So that in our core money that we're seeking donation for, it's the build and the core services that are part and parcel of our model. Um, and so then operations um, becomes really managing the mortgage, repairs, inspection, kind of standard housing costs. I hope that helps. Yeah, thanks, Connie. That's, that's fantastic. We've got uh, someone else asking, I think Erica Ralston, for those of us at the very early stages of getting into the affordable housing, what are some tips you can offer about the kind of internal administrative operations capacity that is needed? So um, maybe one thing that I would offer, having, having been uh, at, the, at the table for Anaganish Affordable Housing for probably over 10 years now, but when, as Connie mentioned, our very first project was a pilot where we built four units of housing. And it's important to note that prior to doing that, uh, you know, we were told by some professionals that we didn't have the capacity to, to successfully engage in a fundraising campaign, that people didn't know enough about our work, they didn't know enough about us as an organization, and they certainly didn't know enough about the need for affordable housing in our quite affluent service-centered university town. And I think one of the one of the biggest things was the tenacity of the, the group sitting around the table at that time who simply wouldn't take no for an answer. And so we decided our initial plan was to build 14 units of housing. We, we weren't bankable for 14, so we decided to go with what we could and we built four. Building four gave us proof of product. So we also, so we had proof of product, we had a track record, we had experience under our belt, and we also had built assets at this point. So that set us up in, to be in a much better position uh, to go for a mortgage for, and, and to engage in some capital uh, campaigning in order to add 10 additional units to our, uh, to our inventory. Uh, in terms of administrative operations and those kinds of needs, what we did as an organization is we sat down with our other organizations who had done this before us. 
and we ask them, what are the most important knowledge, skills, and attitudes that you need on your team in order to do these kinds of developments successfully? And then we rent, went out and recruited people with those knowledge, skills, and attitudes. So rather than just asking people, we really were very, very mindful and very intentional, intentional about recruiting the right people to the, to the board to do the work that needed to be done. So those are a few things. Um, administratively and operationally, there's a lot of uh, learning to walk by walking. And that's a pretty common phrase that we say in our meetings from, from time to time and building our capacity as we go. So it's very much a learning organization and one that's always focused on, on process improvement, quality improvement, and um, improvements in terms of sustainability as we go forward. Maybe Pauline, can Chad, I? Will your guide help with that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to offer. Um, I guess you know, Chad already spoke to our our planning grants were really designed for the very earliest stages. We heard. Um, when we were doing all our engagement in the design of the program that there was a bit of a gap in terms of getting a project off the ground to even apply, say, for CMHC seed funding. There's quite a bit of work that needed to be done to prepare to do that kind of an application to get to the kind of next stage. So our planning grant is intentionally a quick, fairly simple application that can get you some initial dollars to get off the ground. Now, that is if you have a project in, like some kind of a project in mind though. Um, and I do wanna also mention our regional energy coaches can also be incredibly helpful. Uh, again, free services to help you get a project started. But if you have somewhat of a project in mind, I did wanna also just put on the table at one of our partners in the regional energy coach program, the Community Housing Transformation Center does also have grants available Say you're at even earlier stages as an organization and you're trying to form an organization or kind of figure things out before getting to the point of being able to even think about like, this is the project that we want to do. Um, they have grants available as well that can help with some of maybe that organizational capacity, governance, that kind of startup work. So I just wanted to also, you know, offer that as, as a resource to check out the Community Housing Transformation Center as well as a, as a resource. That's a great suggestion, uh, Jen. And we've got a comment um, from Celeste Gotel who comments that in, sm in some small rural communities, sometimes these volunteer skills are not as readily available. And that's absolutely the case, absolutely the case. But sometimes the seed money that can be provided like organ from organizations like FCM and from the center and, and in some cases, even from CMHC, it does enable you to, to purchase some of the talent that you might need to move a project forward. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you always have to have all of the talent in-house uh, to get projects off the ground, but there, there definitely are some places where we can look to get that kind of support um, on a project by project basis as well. Yeah, that's a great point. And regional energy coaches can also help you find the right experts too, that's to, right. to provide that support to your project. Yeah. There's a question in the Q&A about did municipalities provide water and sewer also? And um, I, I, I would say no, that that would have been part of the cost of, of developing um, the housing with Antigonish affordable housing, uh, the same as, as any other development. We have a reflection in, in our chat from Art Fisher and Art says, this is so exciting. We have received CMHC seed funding to move forward with a 68 unit net zero new build in Bridgewater. Very exciting. Uh, so solar and geothermal well on, their, on a brownfield commercial site in a perfect location for walkability. And Art is an unpaid board, direct, board of direct, director with remarkable persistence skills. That's hugely important to Art. And uh, hats off to you for doing the work. Um, I appreciate the ability to stack FCM uh, and CMHC funding, also very, very important. I'm appreciating the forthcoming development of organizing ourselves as a nonprofit provincial housing association, which is something else we're working on here in the province. And I'm appreciating applying for FCM new build support. We've done a lot of work to get where we are. 
And that's true of so many organizations around the province and, and arts is just a great example of how you know, community spirit and tenacity goes a long, long way. And if we can couple that with supports from organizations like FCM, that can kind of help us move the needle to where we need to be to actually um, create the housing that's so desperately needed in the province. And Erica is commenting, if and when the skills are not available in the pool of volunteers, there may be community partners who could help build those skills. That's absolutely true, Erica. If there's one thing we're blessed with in, in Nova Scotia, it's, um, it, it's a great number of educational institutions and, and community organizations that are always willing to partner and help each other. So building the capacity locally is definitely one of the ways forward. And I think that's something we can continue to explore. And it's great to know about the capacity building tools uh, Chad and Jen that FCM is developing and making available to uh, all kinds of folks doing this work in, in local communities. Um, Nancy has commented, I think creating a learning community of practice, sometimes we call that a community of learning, uh, to share from these projects will be helpful to the newer organizations. And I, 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 I'm sure that's absolutely true. And hopefully that's something that uh, once we become a little better organized in the province, we'll be able to support on a larger scale. Uh, Chad has commented that our team would be happy to connect, connect with you, Art. We're motivated to offer support every step of the way. Feel free to connect us at any time. So fabulous comments and uh, really great information that's been shared here this evening. I would certainly like to thank our speakers this evening. Jen, Chad, and Connie, thank you so much for all that you've brought in terms of your knowledge and, and experience and how generous you've been with sharing that with all of us. I would like to thank the people behind the scenes this evening who made this webinar possible. Uh, Nancy O'Regan, Brian Lazuri, Jenny McDonald, and Sue Hawks uh, at the Cody Institute who've provided fantastic coordination and communication support. And again, I would like to acknowledge the support of Employment and Social Development Canada for their sponsorship of this event. And finally, I would like to thank all of you for joining us this evening. Um, and I would like to also let you know that this, well, this completes our series of three webinars on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and Affordable Housing in Nova Scotia. We are now moving into a series of four people schools and people schools, in this case, they're two hour virtual workshops that start with the knowledge of the people in the room. And we're gonna have four of these that delve a little bit deeper into four of the UN SDGs specifically. Um, next Wednesday from 10 until 12 in the morning, we'll be looking at health outcomes and affordable housing. And we will welcome Connie Clement back to be a resource person for us during that people during the people's school. And that will be much more of a workshop format. So not presentation, but we'll actually uh, hear from everyone who joins us in the room. So please feel free to sign up for that one if you can. The following Wednesday, we will talk about affordable housing and environmental sustainability. And we will welcome Ramsey Cower to act as our resource person for that one. Ramsey was with us last Wednesday evening. Some of you will recall uh, for our webinar at that time. We will have a third people school that will be looking at affordable housing and diversity, equity, inclusion, and decolonization. And we will have a fourth and final people school that considers the role of municipal government and affordable housing in the province of Nova Scotia. So registration is now open for next week's People School. Keep your eye open uh, for in your mailbox and as well as our social media channels for that advertisement. And without any further uh, comments this evening, I would just say thank you so much for joining us. Again, thanks to Jen, Chad, and Connie, and everyone who tuned in for this webinar. I'm Pauline McIntosh, and I wish you a very good night. Thanks, everyone.